Uh, our next speaker is also a neighbor, is uh, Philippe Gambet. He's coming from uh, the University Val-de-Marne, which is not far from Paris. And he's going to tell us about uh, phylogenetic networks. So, Philippe, it's up to you. Thank you for the invitation. I will share the slides. And so I can also say that my university just changed its name. That's usually in France. Now it's called Université Gustave Eiffel. Uh, but indeed, it's in the east of Paris. So I'll speak about phylogenetic networks and uh, how advanced are the methods? Maybe speak about the advances in the last five years in this field. Um, so first I will give a quick introduction to phylogenetic networks and then describe what I think are the main trends currently in this field. So I like to see phylogenetic networks as a generalization of phylogenetic trees. And it means that it generalizes two aspects um, phylogenetic trees are used for. First, uh, they are used for classification and they are also used to describe evolution phylogenetic trees. It's the same for networks and we gave them uh, a name to distinguish them in the literature. You have the abstract or data display phylogenetic networks to classify, to visualize data. So here you have a few examples that are constructed by various um, software. And you have the more explicit phylogenetic networks to model evolution. And in those networks, however they are drawn, you always find a root, for example, here or here, representing the ancestral the ancestor of all those species, the species which are in the leaves, and you have those reticulations, the nodes with uh, more than one parent. Um, you can see here on this gallery of phylogenetic networks of explicit ones, because I will focus mostly on those. They are most useful for biologists. Um, you can see that actually there are uh, several software to at least visualize them, to draw them. Uh, there is not yet um, a unique method which has uh, really imposed itself in the field. And actually, maybe this is related to this question, how hard is it to reconstruct a network? It's quite hard. It's harder than reconstructing trees. And it's often NP-hard, meaning when the data increases, the, the time to build the network is just exploding, like mostly exponentially. And we can see this in a very recent survey by uh, Louis Naclay and his team uh, at uh, Rice University in Texas. Um, he says that, so after describing all the existing methods, and uh, especially in this team, they developed the Phylonet uh, software, which implements um, maximum parsimony approaches, maximum likelihood approaches. But he says that, uh, well, they say that the, the limitations are about scalability. And currently those methods can only handle species networks with a handful of taxa. And when, when they uh, are built directly from uh, multi-locus sequences, less than 200 loci. And so that's what we have to face in the field. So what should we do to build these generalizations of phylogenetic trees when we have reticulation coming from hybridization, lateral gene transfer or recombination? And yeah, more precisely what has been done in the last five years. So first, keep calm and maybe simplify your model. Um, those um, uh, algorithms in Phylonet are very nice, but you see they want to deal with duplication, loss, uh, incomplete uh, lineage sorting. So maybe that's too much to handle in the same time. And uh, one of the nicely defined simple problems about phylogenetic networks was that hybridization network problem, where the idea is you have two trees, gene trees, for example, and you want to find the smallest network, the species network, containing both of the trees, expecting that uh, the history of each gene should be contained in the history of the species network. Uh, so it's actually quite easy to do if you just want to have a network containing the two trees. Here you see you have two gene trees, T1 and T2, at the root above the two trees, you glue the leaves together, and then you have four uh, reticulations in this example. Uh, maybe that's too many reticulations. So the hard part is to have the minimum number of reticulation in this network that you're constructing. So this is, yeah, this is hard because the network I show you here is easy to build, but not optimal. 
so actually it's NP-hard, again, proved uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and actually, quite quickly, people realized that even checking the solution was NP-hard. Meaning if you have the, a candidate, a possible species network, and if you have a gene tree, it's not even simple to see if the tree is found inside the network. That is called the tree containment problem. And so I can define it a bit more uh, precisely as I do it here. Uh, if I have the tree, the network, can I remove some arcs in the networks, in the network, the, the, the red arcs here, such that I obtain a tree which is equivalent to the treaty, meaning for each arc of the treaty, you can find a path in uh, what remains of the network. So for example, this arc is this path. So uh, it seems quite uh, bad news that this problem is in P-hard, but you can see that in the last five years, there has been a lot, there have been a lot of publications on them. Uh, you can go to this website, philnet.info actually, to, to find some literature about networks. There are about 30 papers about the methods, methodology of phylogenetic networks published in each year internationally. And so you see that this problem has attracted a lot of attention. It's, it's a good example of how you can simplify not only the problem you're studying, here, uh, this uh, hybridization problem I talked to you about, but also what you expect to obtain. The network you are reconstructing, it could be a binary network, as general as possible, but many classes, many restrictions on networks have appeared in the literature, and they are summarized here on this graph, um, which has been made uh, with two students, Maxim Morgado and Narges Tavassoli, and uh, which is available on this website. Uh, those classes, so they represent sets of phylogenetic networks with a special property. And um, the idea is that the arrows show containment. The class of binary stable networks, however they are defined, contains a class of binary tree child networks, meaning each tree child network is a nearly stable network. So why is it nice to have those inclusion relationships? Because we know that if we can solve a problem on this class, then we can obviously solve the problem as easily uh, with the same algorithm on a subclass. On the contrary, if we know that some problem is hard to solve on a subclass, then we know it will be as, uh, in the worst case, uh, as hard to solve in the superclasses. Uh, so that's inspired by the ISGCI um, infrastructure in graph theory. And it was useful for this uh, tree containment problem to actually really uh, understand how it worked. In 2011, after the first publications on it, we already had some results about some classes of networks where it was difficult to solve in red, some where it was easy to solve, and then uh, well, we started some work on this with some colleagues in Marne la Vallée and uh, in Singapore, Lucien Zhang and Andres Gunawan. And uh, well, we managed to obtain sometimes, well, yeah, mostly uh, algorithms, practical algorithms on other classes. And uh, they actually obtained uh, uh, an algorithm uh, on, a, on, a, on an open problem on binary reticulation visible networks in 2016, which was improved two years later by Matthias Veller to obtain a linear time algorithm. So, meaning that on, we, we are starting to understand better how trees can be found inside networks um, when we are looking for those. Uh, and actually, we can even go further now. This year was the first year where we had some results on the network containment problem, meaning is a species network contained in another one. And so this could be useful to compare two networks if you're uh, uh, yeah, evaluating some candidates to see uh, what is comparable between the two. Uh, another thing you have to deal with is maybe knowing your network space. Why? Because most of the likelihood approaches, they try to explore this network space to find the network with the highest likelihood. And how do you do that? Well, first you must know how big your network space is. And we know that it's uh, bigger than tree space, but before I wanted to speak about the size of the objects themselves. Uh, actually, on a tree on n leaves, you know that you have approximately n vertices, as many vertices as leaves, inside the, the tree at least. Um, 
it's not the case for general networks because you can always add reticulations without adding leaves and you will add nodes inside the network, but no more leaves. But this is not true for some of the restrictions that we found. And this was actually a key point in 2015 to prove our results on tree containment. We proved that on some of those classes, we could bound uh, the number of nodes in the network. The, the network cannot be uh, too large. And uh, it was even improved by our co-authors uh, in the end of, the, of that year. Um, so, so you know, see, that is the first tool that we can really use for algorithms, bounding the size of our objects. Now, knowing the size of the search space is useful to know what you're facing. And uh, well, this is the paper I've been working on for the longest time. In 2011, we started this work and we finally um, submitted it and uh, got it accepted this year. Uh, so counting, for example, those level two networks, well, you know that there are three billions of them which with only six leaves. That's a bigger number than trees. You know that this is obtained by this awful formula. But what I find interesting is, well, first that it attracted the attention of many colleagues in mathematics, because you see that quite a few publications uh, are about counting different kinds of uh, such restricted networks. But also maybe it opens uh, a path for random generation of phylogenetic networks. When you know how to count them all, you can also generate them randomly with the same chains of appearing for each uniformly. And this is very important to be sure that you can um, uh, make, um, well, uh, visit your search space in, in, a, in a balanced way. Sample the search space efficiently. Uh, then, okay, you, you know your search space, but how do you walk in it? How do you explore it? Well, traditionally on trees, you have those NNI moves, meaning you exchange some branches to change the topology and get another candidate where you will compute the, uh, the likelihood, for example. It was defined as well for networks by Cathy Huber and her co-authors in 2016. We proposed um, maybe easier definition one year later uh, with uh, co-authors from Montpellier and the Netherlands. And we also propose an extension of SPR moves, which are uh, uh, usual for trees, uh, which was also done independently by Bordwich, Linz and Sambal in the New Zealand. And uh, you see in the literature that, well, first uh, this SPR distance was already present in the phylogenetic network literature, but only since uh, then, since 2017, we, we start to see SPR moves on networks and, and really studies on how they work and do they allow to explore the whole space of networks. So now that you can explore the uh, network space, uh, you know, you should be able to compute the uh, likelihood easily or to update it easily or, or to propose a candidate easily. And this is um, what the new techniques that have been introduced recently can, uh, where well, they can help. Uh, so actually agreement for us, it's not that new. They appeared like 15 years ago to compute this SPR distance between trees. And it helped also to solve this hybridization problem, putting the two trees together inside the most uh, parsimonious network. But uh, more recently, you see on this graph, um, cherry picking methods appeared. Um, yeah, so that's a nice algorithm to solve the same problem, the hybridization problem, but when you have more than two trees. Um, you, you can find those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, graphs on the, on the slides and click on them if you want to access the publication on, on the Filenet uh, website. And also we found that network decompositions were quite useful to, to solve several problems, especially tree containment problems. And that's what uh, helped our co-authors to, to get this result in 2016 on tree containment. Uh, but we can, also, we can also rely on existing powerful tools, not only new ones. For example, FPT algorithms, fixed parameter tractability, um, for a bit more than 10 years in bioinformatics and in phylogenetics and in phylogenetic networks, as you can see on the graph here, they are used because, how do they work? The idea is that you, you find a parameter which, which is small in your data, even if the data is big. So for example, you expect that there are not a lot of reticulations, uh, that some parameter, the level, level, the level will be small. And then the idea is that you try to find an algorithm, an FPT algorithm, 
where it will be very slow if this parameter is high, but it's fine because it's a small parameter, and it will still be uh, feasible, still be tractable if the size of the input increases. So it explodes, but only in the size of something which remains small. And you see that it has had a lot of success for uh, to build phylogenetic networks, for example. But also to visualize them, I, I show you uh, three recent results on the archive preprint, which show that if you want to visualize it, like on the left, uh, it's NP-hard, but if you allow those snakes, it becomes a bit more easy with this FPT algorithm I was just talking about, and it becomes even easier with these ears, meaning you have those uh, reticulations only going through the, the right of the picture. So here, the, the, the goal each time is to minimize the number of crossing. And it's interesting to see that those authors, Jonathan Clavito and Peter Stumpf, they come from graph theory, they have a background in graph drawing, and they used it in this field of phylogenetic networks. We also showed in 2012 and then in 6, 2017, and then other authors from mathematics showed the links between abstract and explicit networks. Uh, and also, we can use solvers, not only mathematical theorems, but also solvers, SAT solvers, ILP solvers, CSP solvers, etc. You see, it's quite rare for the moment, but it starts to work. And we're doing this with our colleagues in Lille for the moment about tree containment. And so in the end, you will have to put everything together. This will require good engineering work, uh, for example, to use uh, distributed algorithms, parallel computing, but also to make nice software. We know that our colleagues in bioinformatics and biology like it when we think of them when we build our software. Uh, we have the example of um, the Tübingen group of Daniel Husson with split street dendroscope and the new phyllo sketch to draw those networks and find some properties about them. We have also web applications. T-Rex uh, developed in Montreal is very easy to use. Also some packages uh, for people who are used to uh, use R or Julia. It's very nice. And so finally, you can keep calm and build your phylogenetic networks with all of this. Ah, maybe I should stop uh, currently and I put it later. How many teams of network scientists investigating phylogenetic networks? Well, you can find this answer on philnet.info because there is a graph of co authors. And what is interesting, so I, I would say maybe, yeah, like 10 teams or something like that, between 10 and 20. But you see, as I showed some. Ideas from com, come from very different fields, and often people just publish one publication inspired by the field, and they, they then, then they don't uh, work on networks anymore. And what is very interesting when we analyze this co-author graph is that we see that in the last 10 years, people are working more and more together, people with very different backgrounds, and I think this is really useful to make uh, progress in the field towards really usable tools. Um, a hot problem in network science, <laughs> uh, network reconstruction to study hybridization or gene transfer. I, I don't see um, in network sciences in general a um, uh, very strong connection with phylogenetic networks because contrary to network sciences where usually we, we, we have the network as an input here, the network is an output. And this change things, changes things. Um, well, you could say it's the same in graph theory in the more theoretical parts of uh, uh, network sciences. And, and we found some connections and we use some theorem. So maybe this is still something to do. And that's why a day like today is very interesting to share ideas and, and see how we can progress uh, while well, using other kinds of networks indeed. Um, the, uh, best practices to detect gene transfer. Uh, I'm not sure about this because the, the methods are very diverse to detect gene transfer. They, don't, they are not only phylogenetic uh, network or even phylogenetic methods. You can also work directly on the sequence. And, and I haven't seen um, direct recommendations, but maybe I would say that uh, just be careful when you use another technique, but it would be the same if you use only phylogenetic network techniques. Uh, keep track of what is going on uh, apart from your field, um, away from your field. For example, it's interesting that in this survey by Louis Naclay, 
uh, he mentions the Abba Baba test, and it was one of the first times that I, I heard it in uh, in phylogenetic network field. And, and yeah, the connection was not really done before with this uh, other technique. And and yeah, I think it's it's interesting to be aware of other possibilities. Um, and and also yeah, if the data is not tree like, well, uh, that's often what um, what those data display methods allow to. Uh, to know quite easily because uh, they don't try to find really the uh, evolutionary histories. They just, yeah, give you this first estimation of how far is it from a tree. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's it's m much easier. And and maybe I didn't speak a lot about this. Uh, I didn't speak also on about distances between phylogenetic networks or about reconstructing networks from subparts because that's methods which had appeared already uh, 20 or 15 years ago. And so, yeah, this was not about the most recent advances. Thanks a lot.